Welcome to Clarifying Catholicism's Science of Catholic Teaching. In this series, we examine the Church's teachings on marriage and sexuality from a scientific perspective. Most of the studies cited in this series were compiled in Father Robert Spitzer's The Moral Wisdom of the Catholic Church, a defense of her controversial moral teachings, and they can be found in the description. Without further ado, on to the show. In this series, we've largely analyzed how things like pornography, premarital sex, and same-sex intercourse can be harmful to interpersonal relationships. Today, though, we're going to take a look at a phenomenon that is far more personal than interpersonal, transgenderism. And due to its sensitive nature, it requires a key disclaimer. First of all, there is not a ton of data on issues surrounding transgenderism, yet. However, as Father Spitzer argues, there is certainly enough data to suggest that any attempts to move forward with normalizing gender transitions, especially among children, should be halted. The Bible doesn't speak too much about transgenderism precisely because it wasn't exactly a big topic back in the day. It does, however, speak about the sanctity of the body as a temple. Logically, part of that sanctity is respecting the body God gave you. This is something that transgenderism threatens to disrupt. Okay, time for another disclaimer. There are indeed people who are born with biological abnormalities, specifically intersex conditions, and those abnormalities do indeed deserve treatment. The critiques of transgenderism presented in this episode are largely directed at the movement to normalize gender-affirming therapy and surgery as treatments for people who do not have major biological abnormalities, especially children. With that out of the way, let's return to Spitzer's levels of happiness. Level 1, materialistic pleasure is concerned with immediate gratification. To a person questioning their gender, transgender treatments may grant them this. Level 2, ego comparative is about finding happiness by, well, comparing yourself to other people. For a guy who wants others to see him as a girl, perhaps one could make the argument that gender-affirming therapy and surgery could yield this kind of happiness. Level 3, Contributive Empathetic, is all about giving to others. Particularly in the Christian context of marriage, it is your capacity to give yourself to your spouse in the ultimate way of using sex to bring forth new life. This is where things start to fall apart as the treatments in sexual reassignment surgery can destroy one's sexual organs. Not only that, but gender-affirming therapy prevents us from realizing the goodness our sexuality can contribute to others. Level 4, Transcendent Faith-Based, is affected the most by transgender treatments because they can damage if not destroy the God-given gift of sexuality. Let's turn to the science behind the Church's teachings. One of the biggest arguments you may hear from advocates of gender-affirming care is that mainstream academics approve of it. This is flawed for two reasons. The first of which I spoke about in an episode on same-sex attraction. Hardly any good employment-fearing academic will present data against gender-affirming care. I say that from personal experience, that I've known many renowned medical professionals who privately oppose these practices but would never dare utter a word against them publicly out of fear of losing their jobs. Additionally, the United States medical industry has a rather rocky track record when it comes to endorsing questionable medical practices. Think about lobotomies or over-medicating children. The former, of which we especially recognize in hindsight, how very little evidence was used to justify a rather barbaric practice. The issue of overmedicating children is being increasingly exposed today. From personal experience, it seems like the pharmaceutical industry has made a massive profit from turning my generation into addicted customers and pushing experimental drugs on us. For example, for decades, psychiatrists believed that the lack of serotonin production caused depression. So they developed medication that would boost serotonin levels. Today, there is serious question about whether or not there's even a link between depression and serotonin levels. My point is twofold. There are large academic biases and economic forces that prevent a lot of good research from being conducted. That said, what do the studies show so far? A good preliminary question is what causes gender disorders? 
In 2005, before gender treatments entered the mainstream, it was estimated that 40 to 55% of cross-gender kids had experienced abuse. This already shows how environmental conditions are an important determinant of gender dysphoria and other such disorders. In 1995, again before the transgender movement gained momentum, the mothers of roughly 80% of boys who reported gender confusion had a psychological disorder. While time will clarify the cause of gender dysphoria, some of these early stats seem to imply that a child's environment can impact the way they understand their gender. But do these treatments work? Lawrence Meyer and Paul McHugh write, Adolescents with gender identity disorder have poor anxiety tolerance. Seeking sex reassignment surgery is a defensive solution and a mechanism for control of anxiety. The thought of not having a solution for their distress increases their anxiety, thus making it very difficult to achieve a therapeutic alliance. This seems to mean that giving adolescents a sex change doesn't actually treat their underlying anxieties or depression. Rather, it sweeps their emotional distress under the rug by providing a temporary bandage that makes them feel like they're in control. Basically, these kids don't need surgery. They need therapy. In Spitzer's framework, these treatments might satisfy levels 1 and 2 of happiness, which focus on short-term pleasure, but certainly not levels 3 and 4, which rely heavily on humble self-reflection and surrender to God's plan. And while there are reports that gender-affirming care results in lessened anxiety and mental health problems in the short term, these problems only seem to pop up again in the long run. People who have transitioned are 19 times more likely than the national average to commit suicide. Just as we covered in our episode on same-sex attraction, this does not seem to be an issue of acceptance of these people by their peers. Data from countries like Sweden, which have practiced these treatments for decades now, shows how 10 to 15 years after gender reassignment, transgender people's suicide rate rose to 20 times that of their peers. Aside from the mental effects these surgeries can have on people, there are physical ones too, especially for children and adolescents. Doctors increasingly agree that puberty blockers are harmful to bone density and cause osteoporosis. Just one year on cross-sex hormones can lead to sterility. A recent study in a major British medical journal argues that the standards used by the APA, the Endocrine Society, and the WPATH are not evidence-based. Many secular EU countries are banning or restricting transitioning procedures on children because they are looking at the science. Again, this isn't to say that nobody should be receiving these treatments. I refer to my comment on people born intersex. Rather, these treatments shouldn't be pushed on everyone who, quite naturally, questions their masculinity or femininity during adolescence. There are people, especially those born intersex, who can benefit from these treatments, but doctors should be very careful to suggest them to patients. And yes, an overwhelming percentage of children and adolescents who question their gender end up aligning with their natural biological sexuality by the time they are adults. These treatments may seem appealing because they provide short-term happiness, especially on levels 1 and 2 but they fail to grant long-term fulfillment. They make you feel good physically initially and help you feel like you fit in when you compare yourself to others. But the potentially destructive effects these treatments have will hinder your ability to form connections with other people, especially in the ultimate sexual connection that is sanctified by marriage. We need to be careful with what we do to our God-given bodies. They are temples which empower us to participate in the ultimate creative act, which is conceiving a child. Anything that disrupts this beautiful process should be carefully scrutinized, which is why the church is so hesitant to endorse widespread gender reassignment surgery. Well, next episode will be our last one, and it will investigate the, again, controversial topic of contraception. Thank you very much. Have a great day. God bless you. <music>